Hey there everyone, thank you for joining me today on Retro Tech and uh, welcome to a new question and answer session. Today I'm specifically going over YouTube questions that I've gotten over the last three weeks. I've got quite a few good ones. It's going to be about a 20 minute video. So just sit back, relax, and uh, see if there's something on here that might interest you. Um, in the background I've got my JVC uh, D-Series with a pretty recognizable movie and that is on VHS so I'm just gonna leave that going hopefully it turns out okay for the viewing audience but let's just go ahead and jump right into the content I think there's some interesting things here so first I want to talk about a discussion I had with Keith Gable Keith and I have been discussing the PVM uh, N series the Sony PVM N series I have an N1 uh, 20N1U that uh, I'm going to be RGB mining. It's going to be coming. That video is going to be coming this week, I think. But uh, we're going to work on that. I specifically am, but Keith's been helping me um, go through schematics, and we realize a lot of these things match up with other uh, N series. Almost all the N series parts are pretty kind of almost interchangeable. So that just lets me know that uh, re or. Uh, kind of reinforces the the point that we proved in the restoration video where sometimes you can swap around parts from certain uh, PVMs back and forth and they'll work together. Okay, so let's go on. Albert has some color problems with one of his PVMs. He's only got one color showing or maybe he's missing a color. And generally there are color drives on the back of the yoke neck board and they're just little uh, parts that are you can Google them to see more information about them, but they're the color drives, and they'll have uh, um, parts that go bad on that line. So I've got one that needs to have that done, so eventually they'll be do a video whenever I go through and do that one. It's just one of the smaller PBMs, a 8-inch. So that's generally the problem. Uh, that would be if you're missing a color or missing two colors. Uh, now, if the tube's bad and it's missing a color, changing that part won't help. So if you still have the problem after that, it's either the tube's bad or some other part um, in that color line is broken by either a transistor or something. So, uh, again, good question there. OJ, how hard do you change, uh, I'm sorry, how hard do you chase corner convergence? And he said he's added strips on the back of one of his PVMs. And it's pretty good, but he's got a little bit of a color separation that he's trying to work out. Again, you can chase this as long as you want, and honestly, it is almost um, near impossible to get them 100% perfect uh, across all the corners and everything. And that's why if you read the manuals, it'll actually tell you that these CRTs most of the time are only built to be at the most like 97% accurate uh, screen depiction. So they're even admitting that with this uh, this type of technology you're just it's really hard to get it perfect so uh, my, I always say get it as best as you can because you could spend hours trying to adjust something and never really get it right and then you'll never stop looking at the problem area so just try to get it out of your head and accept the little bit of problems it has and just ignore it and enjoy the other areas that look great on the screen <laughs> uh, Henry Cardenas says uh, he has a JVC also television and has a picture-in-picture -picture board and if he removed it, would the uh, TV still function? The same, minus the loss of the picture-in-picture -picture functionality? I think so. Uh, most of the time, picture-in-picture -picture boards that are just little cards inserted into a television board, or the chassis, chassis excuse me, I don't have a hard time saying that. But the chassis, if it's not in there, it's not going to affect the uh, TV from turning on or functioning with every other function usually. Uh, Bartek Schuster had a great question about how many hours do I think a consumer grade CRT would handle? Uh, this is kind of uh, difficult to judge because there's not a CRT that's a consumer grade that I'm aware of that has hour counter in it. Uh, most of the time though, you're pretty safe with the consumer grade CRT and the reasons are, for the most part, if you turn it on it looks really good, there's no uh, bleeding or if it, if it shows all your colors pretty good and um, you want to check for any kind of screen burn because screen burns you're not going to be able to fix usually. So if there's no screen burn, the TV should be fine. And as far as hours, let's just think about an, uh, uh, mathematically. If you had your CRT running four hours, three hours a day, um, nearly every day of the year, you'd still only put about a thousand hours at the end of the year on the TV. So 
you know, these TVs weren't used heavily for a long period of time generally. I mean, the longest somebody might use one is 10 years, but most of the time people didn't use them a full 10 years. They never used uh, the TV. So if it's a high quality TV like a Sony Trinitron or a JVC or Panasonic, you know, one of those good brands, it's, it's going to be able to go up there, you know, 40, 50,000 hours, and you yourself, you know, you're only putting a thousand hours a year on it, so you're going to get ten years good use out of it. The screen looks pretty good. Usually, it's the other parts of the TV that fail, not the screen. So the good news is, is you can tell a lot about a screen just by pretty much turning it on, and just have something with you that you can put a signal to. Uh, when I go check CRTs, I generally take like a Sega Genesis. It's small, easy to carry around, and um, you know, you plug it in pretty easily to anything with a composite, or you can even take the uh, RF with you. So that's my recommendation for that. Um, LAC64 said, do I have any parts lists or um, capacitor lists? I've been getting asked for that from other people too. So the deal is with that, that we're going to, I'm going to offer that as part of my Patreon um, benefits. You will get access to all my cap kits. I'm still working on perfecting those. I have got about four or five PBM cap kits ready and obviously I've got a cap kit for the Samsung CRT as well as the other Sony CRT uh, but I you know and also as far as like the build outs on things um, like the RGB mods things like that is going to be benefits of that Patreon so I'm sorry to have to do it that way but I've got to um, I've got to do something to try to to try to do get some funds up for things like this next question. Paul Darrington asks, do you have a uh, any kind of CRT rejuvenating device or CRT uh, tester? And the truth is no, I don't. I want to get things like that. I want to get things like that. I want to get a oscilloscope, some other important tools to get around here so we can make some more video content, do some more tests on these tubes, and perfect even more what we're working on. And that's all going to be done mostly through probably Patreon because um, YouTube just doesn't give you a whole lot of sharing on the money or anything, you know, so it's not like you get a lot of money there to really buy anything. So that's the best way I see it is that the, um, you know, as the channel can grow, I'll be able to reinvest in it by getting new tools and rarer tools like that and using them to make more content. Kenny Lauderdale always has some great questions and he has one here for, he has a PVM where his corners seem to veer off and uh, get wonky and he can't change them through his pin settings in the menus and if it's consistent like that more than one corner then yeah it's probably your caps the caps need to be replaced on there um, I'd get it I'd get it checked out because uh, you don't want caps to go bad and leak uh, but that's probably that's a sign that the caps are bad another sign is if you make an adjustment and it um, holds only for like an hour or two and you come back and the adjustment's gone and it's wonky again in the corners. That's generally a sign. Uh, another thing to check is screen linearity. If anything looks weird on that and you try to change your linearity settings and it's not changing it, that's another sign that you've got bad caps in your deflection board uh, and you can't do anything for bad caps except change them. So if you're not having any success through the service menu, change the caps. Uh, scrollings. I have Trinitrons that all exhibit horizontal bowing, a lot like the last question, and uh, he wants to keep them. But yes, again, try the service menu. If you've never serviced the CRT you, you're worried about before, it's probably because it's time to be serviced. Uh, generally speaking, it's going to be 25 years old, most likely. So that means taking it apart, cleaning it, cap replacement, and uh, that whole process of recalibration afterwards uh, with the service menu. So that's that's the whole recommendation I make for those uh, TVs. Kenny Lauderdale, again, are 800 line PVMs darker than 600 lines in nature? Uh, what's the difference a little bit? That's just a little bit of resolution increase. Lines are going to be a little bit more line count, a little bit denser line count. Should have um, a little, tiny bit sharper picture, but honestly you won't see a huge amount of difference between an 800 and 600 line monitor. Sometimes even an, if an 800 line monitor is worn out, it could look worse than a 600 line monitor that, that is in good shape. So it's hard to say. It's really going to depend on the condition of the individual monitor. 
and it's not a huge jump at all by any case between 800 and 600 lines. Zeke Barrett, are all these methods that you apply to CRTs, can they be done to other types of CRT monitors? The truth is yes. Now it's not going to work on you know a different type of technology like flat screens, but any type of CRT is going to use the same style and type of technology for the most part. Okay, for the next question, Stephen Norton. Um, he's been using RGB cables for his consoles and SCART specifically on his 20L5 and he wanted to get more color saturation out of his TV. Now you're not going to really, really be able to do that uh, using RGB because RGB pumps in is just straight up color. You can't use gain or phase or any of those uh, chroma adjustments on that. What you can do is if you really want to um, the first thing I do is check what your color temperature setting is for your uh, monitor uh, and pick the one that looks best for you on that one and then go in and check your sub brightness and your sub contrast on your service menu and turn those up a little bit and see how that looks and then um, if you're still not satisfied you know the only way to really push that further would be to convert your RGB to component and then use the component in on that monitor and then you can use all those chroma and phase increase and gains and you can actually blast those colors but you're going to get color bleed if you do that and it's going to really fade out of your scan lines and push the monitor to a point where it's not really good to run it like that so don't go too over the top with it uh, David G asked about capacitors and he was wondering if it's true that they're more dangerous he said he had read it was more dangerous than the uh, cathode or the, or the anode cap or the um, connector in the back of the TV which isn't true that's the most dangerous is that uh, that area in the back of the CRT that that cathode connects to the CRT that's that's where the electricity is held up it's much more dangerous than the caps are on these CRTs most of the time the caps are going to be under the board uh, I'll show you how to discharge a cap and the next time I, I change a cap on there but uh, you know, the only time you're ever going to do something is if you actually even went down and it had energy in it and you put your hand down, bare hand, and touched both ends together, you might get uh, a current run through your finger right there. But I've never even been shocked by a, a capacitor. I don't want anybody to think that's really going to hurt them or, you know. These TVs usually aren't full of extremely high voltage capacitors or anything uh, that are going to be that harmful. Just, again, take precautions. Don't do anything silly and even give yourself a risk of hurting yourself. So just, because I mean, if you fell and hit that part of the board anyway, you're going to poke your hand all up and, and you know, get scratches that'll hurt without getting shot. And many people have been asking about a screwdriver or something to change, uh, to get to the flyback and change focus and screen brightness. And that's a good idea. I, I'm trying to think of a way. I need somebody to help me with a 3D printer. So if you're interested, contact me. Let me know. And um, I'll work with you if you know how to do a 3D printer. If you're an expert on that, we could come up with something. Because I need something small and plastic that we can just get in there and easily turn those without having to touch it with your fingers. Because right now, I mean, I always have to just touch it with my fingers. After I thoroughly inspect it, I uh, touch it with my fingers and have to use it that way. Uh, Sully 1986, can he swap uh, tubes uh, with similar consumer CRTs and PVMs? Maybe if it's a Sony or some similar type of tube, you might get away with that, but it's not a guarantee. Uh, you first, you got to make sure the pinout on the back of the neck or where the neck board goes in matches. Uh, the problem is then, though, you know, you've got um, you want to make sure it's like similar, so similar that I don't know. I don't know that a consumer grade could go into a, a PVM. Maybe. If it was that, we could try that sometime if, if we came across that situation. And then he asked about a replacing a flyback with a consumer flyback from that to a PVM. I don't think that's going to be possible. I've not, again, found anything good for flybacks replacement. And uh, other than just trying to get a whole new replacement board that's already got the flyback in it, those become available sometime on eBay, so keep your eyes up for that. Uh, Okay, i got a couple more questions here. Will I do a video about adjusting yoke rings? Uh, probably, but again, I need some more tools. There's a specific proper procedure uh, for adjusting that, and you've just got to have the right setup. That's unfortunately one of those things. You've got to have a certain setup to be able to uh, generate the right test pattern and to be able only to generate single colors through your tube so you can line up those rings correctly. 
It's not a hard procedure once you have the right things set up, but I don't have those things set up, and um, I, I just don't, uh, I don't have them myself, so that'll be something else that hopefully I'll be able to acquire from the, uh, you know, Patreon stuff. Charlie Cat uh, asked a great question here, and it's going to be one of the last questions. And he said, what's the um, least favorite CRT model that you come across uh, that wasn't to your liking? And I've been thinking about that. I've had a lot of CRTs, obviously. And one of the worst ones, though, was one of my first pro monitor experiences. It was a Sony BVM, and I thought I got a great deal on it. I did get a pretty good deal on it. It was four years ago. Again, there was no information about BVMs. This was maybe one video was available from Phone Dork and one page on Retro RGB. And so I just randomly got one in an auction that was near me where a guy was pumping out BVMs left and right. I got one for 300 bucks delivered to me and I thought I got a great deal and I was so excited. But I got it home and it was an A series. And this was like before anybody knew anything about avoiding an A series. So I personally had to go through the experience of learning about how rare the video card is in it that supports RGB and component that I didn't get with my monitor. It only did HD, SDI form of video input. So I had that problem. That's a, so I couldn't even use it for a while. I had to get um, a 61D card for it so it would do S video and composite just so I could use it. Then I got to play with it with somebody that made me so upset because I was like, I wanted RGB and I got the most expensive composite S video monitor ever. So. Uh, I couldn't find a 68X card. That's about 2,500 to 3,000 were only made of that ever. So I wasn't going to pay the thousands of dollars it costs to get one of those when they come available. The most expensive thing in, in this hobby is that that card. So I sold the TV to or the monitor to uh, a video production company in New York who worked on documentaries. So that's where it went and they have been using it for documentaries, uh, you know, film editing ever since. So that was a pretty good story. I got at least to get rid of it and I didn't lose any money. So I think that uh, we've got one more question here and it came from quite a few people and it's what do uh, you look for in a TV if you want to RGB mod it? I'm going to try to go real quickly here, but you have to first off find the schematics for that TV. And that looks like a giant blueprint. So find that. Look for two chips. And uh, the TV will need to have two chips, major chips. You know, they'll have a lot of pins on them. And one of those chips needs to be a jungle chip or an IC that usually says video chip. And it needs to have RGB into that as well as a blanking into that. And say OSD or some type of blanking. Most of the time, the pins are all right there in a row, all four together. So check them. Sometimes you have to trace the lines. You have to find those four pins. It has to have that set up to make it uh, the way we've been doing it in the videos. That's how it has to be. The other thing it needs is you'll have to find a good ground spot, a good uh, five volt spot, and then um, you have to have some way to tap into com uh, composite video and ground for sync and then you tap into your audio line. So if it does AV already, like if it's just an RF TV, that'd probably be difficult. I don't know. It might not even have the chip set up. So if it has audio, it usually needs to have uh, at least RCA hookups, or AV hookups, and those two chips. But you're always going to need the schematics on that, so don't even try to do it without them. You won't be able to do it. Anyway, that's all the time for today. Thanks very much for uh, hanging out and watching the video. Um, I hope you have a great weekend. Please look for the new content coming next week. We'll also have things from the show coming up. Uh, i got a lot of things to show when we get it set up. Uh, so look for that from the convention. That will be next weekend. Uh, again, I'm Steve. Have a great day.